But you know, I think one of the big things right now is PBIS, positive behavior intervention and support. Most schools have some overall plan that we're that that they're they're um, working from or moving towards. This is a draft of one of our final parts for our expectation matrix for behaviors. So I wanted you to see that. That's our broad picture for our school. On the next page, you're going to see two different lesson plans that, again, these are drafts uh, that we came up to that with, that I actually came up with. Um, uh, and we had a whole group, of course, that worked together on these that we pulled straight from our expectation matrix. We have a lesson plan for every single expectation or set of expectations on our matrix. One of the things the last um, uh, presenter mentioned was not to be too vague in our wording of what we expect. Because if you're too vague, it leaves too much gray area. So one of the things that we're working on is going through and making sure that our wording is not vague, that we can actually make a lesson plan for each of our behaviors, each set of behaviors, to teach to the students. And so this lesson plan is actually, I've made sure I cited the source of the, um, the person that created this template on the bottom. But I like this template, and, it, and I'm going to show you another one as well here in just a few minutes, um, because it gives the goal. It's meant to be something that you share with your students in advisory at the beginning of the year, wherever is appropriate, and you share the goal, you share the rationale, you get the kids on board with it, and then when you teach this lesson plan, you teach, okay, this is exactly right, this is exactly wrong, this is almost right, but not quite. So we want to take out all those gray areas. So you have a lesson plan to completely teach rules and procedures and expectations that uh, your school has said, this is what we're going to follow. And then there's some role play activities and some other ideas. And, and on the back, some things to go along with teaching this lesson plan, reinforcing this lesson plan. And on every one of these lesson plans, it's going to say, we're not just going to teach these at the beginning of the school year. We're going to reinforce these after every break, after every major holiday. Uh, and we're going to continue to reinforce, reteach, help students learn these behaviors, because they're not going to learn them uh, in one day. Behavior it takes time to change. OK, so those are the next two pages in your packet. And again, they are drafts. The next page in your packet is a different model. It's very similar, but this model comes from the Center for Teacher Effectiveness Time to Teach program. This model here is um, uh, it's very similar, and uh, I, can't, I didn't bring these to reproduce because this is, like I said, part of a program of Time to Teach, and Rick Dahlgren with the Center of Teacher Effectiveness has these materials, but I wanted you to see there's a program out there where if somebody wants to bring this into their school, you can contact this person, and I'll give you the resources at the end of the, the uh, PowerPoint. You can bring that in to help teach your teachers how to implement some of these strategies. And then the next page is we're, we're zeroing down now. Okay, We've got our expectations. We've got our lesson plans to teach them. Things we are going to do, we're not going to do. But what are we going to do to fill our time? We could spend hours here. One of the things we want to remember is the, the state has provided us with very good outlines on accountable talk, things that we should be saying in our classrooms. And then the last page uh, is just some things that I pulled together to, that we could give to students. We could put these things in the student's hand to help them remember, OK, these are your accountable talk. These are the things we want you to say. We've told you what we don't want you to say. Here are some specific things to help you remember what to say. So I hope that something in here will provide uh, some sh resources that you will help you um, this school year. Okay, uh, this first, the first two slides of my program, uh, PowerPoint, are kind of comical. I'm going to let you read them. Does anyone remember this from Facebook or Pinterest this winter? Didn't we have a winter? I heard so many complaints about how much school we missed this year. Parents were like, I, I just have to tell you, I, was, I went to Target one day. We were out of school. I had my children. I'm walking down the aisle, 
And this lady is standing there with her buggy. She's got kids crawling out of her cart and crawling into her cart. And she looks up at me, and she doesn't know me at all. She looks at me and she says, she gets a text apparently. She looks me straight in the eye and says, Bradley County Schools is closed again tomorrow. And I have three kids. She was dead serious. She was very upset. She, had, she was having trouble managing because it was out of their routine. It wasn't a normal procedure. <laughs> Little did she know that sometimes teachers on the last day sometimes feel the same way because we have that battle with our kids that are difficult sometimes. And so, you know, we can relate a little bit. And of course, these are in jest because all parents love their kids and all teachers love their students. Teachers have one of the most difficult jobs in America, but one of the most rewarding jobs. What other profession allows us the potential to positively affect so many lives in the present and in the future? Our jobs are a balancing act. We must balance our compassion for our students with passion in teaching, preparation and planning lessons, and at all times, the very important responsibility of professional self-control. I heard, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard that the word of the year last year was selfie. I don't know if that's true. It seems like it might have been appropriate. And I had no idea what the keynote speaker was going to say when he came in this morning. So I was a little surprised to hear him say what he said about change. The word of the year for 2013 was selfie. In education, we might say that the phrase of the year was a flood of change. Does anyone else feel that way? We had a flood of change last year and the year before. A flood of dramatic change for a large group of people, unsure at times of our destination, having a previous way of life altered dramatically, oftentimes leaving us struggling to stay afloat. Using this example seems appropriate at the, as the term flood is a controversial one, and that is just where education is today. Some changes we face this year have become controversial, leaving some teachers feeling like they are floating on a ship, not knowing its destination or how exactly to get there. We're all unsure of what public education will look like in 5, 10, or 20 years. Individually, we have little control over state and federal legislation from our classrooms, nor can we control what students walk through our doors or the condition that they come to us and when they arrive. However, one factor we can and must control is our actions. Are we moving to Common Core? Or are we just going to update our current standards? Will we adapt our current textbooks? Will we utilize Engage New York? Or will we jump on board with Springboard? We will continue to backwards plan, unpack our embedded assessments, utilize metacognitive markers, and analyze all our students' data. We will discuss the data in our PLCs and adapt our grading procedures to more closely resemble standards-based. We'll also take into account our students' individual and unique needs, such as learning styles, all while identifying, embracing, celebrating, and teaching to the diversity present in our classrooms, schools, and communities. We will give wise and proper thought to the growing population of children with various social, emotional, physical, psychological and medical needs such as autism and autistic tendencies, Asperger's, allergies, vision and hearing challenges, academically gifted, and those with heightened senses of anxiety. We will teach our children who fall along the spectrum of highly developed social and intellectual skills to those who possess little or no social or intellectual skills. Our students are coming to us from diverse family structures oftentimes with less than optimal lifestyles due to drugs, alcohol, suicide, deaths in families. We have an increasing number of children entering school who were added to their families through the miracle of adoption. Obviously, this list could go on. It has become obvious that the skill set required by teachers today is enormous. Skill sets that require us to learn and maintain well-developed habits of self-control and professionalism if we are to manage our classroom efficiently and effectively. Now, I'm not going to stay on this slide too long because there's a, you know, there's, it's a little risque, but these kids are coming to us with not just those psychological and emotional things, but the things they're taking in at home are not always the best for them, okay? Um, 
It requires us to have a shift in thinking. And I love this quote by Dr. Dobson that says, and this, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shift in the way we think about how we handle the discipline in our classrooms. Oftentimes, we see classroom discipline and instruction as costs of teaching. Or at home, discipline as a cost of parenting. But actually, those are our greatest opportunities to show our children, to show our students, to teach them that we believe in them. That is where they learn the positive of their mistake, to learn from their mistake, that we believe in them enough to help them through it, to believe that they can be different, that they can be who they were created to be. If we want to see a change in the way our students behave in our classrooms and schools, we must be the change we wish to see. We must communicate to our students and co-workers that we believe students can be the change they wish to see. We can acknowledge that yes, our students are going to make mistakes, but that we believe in them no matter what they do. We believe they can learn from their mistakes and grow, and we can teach them then to learn to believe in themselves. Uh, one of the things that, I think the best and greatest gift my parents gave to me was that they always believed in me. That, that as I got older, I began to realize no matter what I ever did, my parents never threw that back up or never continued to bring it up. Their expectations for me were always clear. Those positive things are the things they would reiterate to me, they would say to me and they helped me to learn to believe in myself. We have to do that same thing for our children. So, we, got, we need to accept some things that, and these are core beliefs from the Center for Teacher Effectiveness and Time to Teach. The caring is key because kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That conflict is going to happen. We can expect it in our classrooms. We have to be ready for it. Good behavior has to be systematically taught because children are not coming to our schools ready and willing to learn. Some are, some are, but many are not. Behavior can be changed. Good discipline is a matter of good timing. I have a story I want to share with you about uh, to go along with caring is key number one up here the idea behind this belief is um, as I said before that kids sometimes don't know how much they don't care what we know because they have other needs that, that, that are not being met we have to get past the negative initial experiences we sometimes experience with some of these students to see them for what they are and not be offended by them have you ever been offended by a student as a student, have you ever had a student that just simply makes you upset, that maybe your personalities clash, you have conflict with? I think we probably all have, but we have to understand that these children were created for a purpose, and, it's our, and we have this short semester or year to be an influence in their lives. So we need a shift in thinking of even those children that are the most difficult. Ms. Parker and Ms. June were two teachers who worked together on a middle school team one year. They shared the same 130 students and were both highly effective classroom teachers. And both were very well liked by most all who knew them. Of those 130 students, there were a few students that stood out as trouble. Always neglecting their assignments, blurting out in class, talking back, or acting in some other disrespectful way that provided a continual opportunity to knock the learning train off track, so to speak. One particular child, and we'll call him Jim, has already been in trouble, had already been in trouble the year before, and had spent time in campus court and the school system, the school system specialized learning academy for students needing a stronger discipline setting. The year had been a struggle for teachers and students, but Jim had made progress. Close to the end of the term, as Jim was taking part in a small group discussion with Ms. Parker and a few other students, Ms. Parker stated that this class would be so much better off, Jim, if you just weren't here. The next class, Jim went to Ms. June's room. Ms. June had faced the same struggles with Jim, but continually reminded Jim of who he really was 
and what good he was capable of. She even went so far as to tell him what his name meant. I think that's powerful, telling students what their names mean. My name means grace. Janie means grace. And I am so glad my name means grace because I've needed so much of it over the years. Miss June never wavered in her belief in Jim, hoping that he may one day soon look back and decide to believe in himself as she believed in him. She had the same expectations for Jim that she had for her other students and held him accountable consistently. By the, and she was a fair teacher. She never treated him unfairly. By the end of the year, Jim had begun to realize that he was responsible for his choices and could have control of where his life was headed. The words and actions of a teacher are powerful, and we must remember that when we are standing in the presence of our students and be accountable for every word we speak over them. On the last day of school this year, our assistant principal shared this story with our staff. One of his daughters came home from school extremely upset and in tears because it was the last day she would see her teacher. She had learned that day that Miss Hilliard would be retiring and would no longer be at school. Both parents lovingly tried to console their daughter. They told her that she would get a new teacher next year and that all of her teachers would remain special to her over time that her next year's teacher would also be wonderful and that she would most likely see Miss Hilliard again. Still, no matter what they shared with this little girl, she remained in deep distress. As her father lay beside her for prayers that night, the father again reassured his daughter, his tearful daughter, that all would be well. She would miss her teacher, but that she would begin to feel better soon and that her fond memories of Miss Hilliard would remain. All at once, the little girl blurted out in desperation, but Daddy, you don't understand. Miss Hilliard loves me, and I love her. I happened to know this particular teacher. Her daughter was one of my own students. I understood completely why this little girl was so distressed. Miss Hilliard was the most positive, loving teacher and parent I had ever met in my entire life. She found the good in you, no matter who you were. She noticed your strengths and never mentioned your weaknesses. Her love for you surrounded you and penetrated, penetrated your very being within seconds of being in her presence. Just speaking with her brought out the best in you and helped you believe in yourself, even when you had forgotten you had a best. So we come to some leadership styles. The first style, the authoritarian leader. I like to say that this was probably... Uh, this is probably an author a, a, a style that most new teachers have, or, or, well, you know, I was a young teacher. I wouldn't call myself permissive, but as a young mother, I was more authoritarian. They were going to do what I said, when I said, said it, no excuses. Sometimes authority, there's a place for that, but sometimes being too authoritarian will bring out rebellion and resistance. Resistance first, then rebellion. Then we have our permissive teachers. Those are normally your new teachers or your student teachers. Uh, I've seen student teachers that, um, because they weren't comfortable in the classroom, they allowed students to get too close. They share their Facebook pages and they'll do things that, 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 that really are not, um, well, they're unprofessional and they don't realize it yet. Being permissive actually brings about, um, it makes it harder to, to attain classroom management. Then our third type of leadership style that we're going to talk about is simple, authorit authoritative. You give your kids a choice and then you honor that choice. It's that simple and it's that hard, but it takes self-control. You're going to get the outcomes of this leadership style are often better grades, better relationships, higher paying jobs later on, solid relationships better on, self-confidence, better problem solving skills, because kids have learned to deal with consequences. They've learned that there are consequences. Choices and natural consequences is one of those things in life that helps students learn impulse control, develops the executive function in the brain, and teaches respect and wisdom. So how can we do that? Self-control. On the teacher's part, we said one of the key factors um, in cl good classroom management is understanding that conflict it's going to happen. Conflict is inevitable in the school culture. Combat, however, is optional. Calm is contagious and silence is powerful. 
Okay, so let's say that we have, and here's where we're going to get into some scenarios. Let's say we have a student that um, you're teaching, you're doing an instructional part of your, your lesson, and you're up at the whiteboard and you're giving instruction, and a student blurts out, this is stupid, or this is not the way Miss Smith taught it. Have we heard that before? And a whole lot of others, right? Kids are really good at that, especially if they don't want to do what you're doing. If it's hard and they don't want to do it, they can get you off track. I have seen student after student be the one that's supposed to have the responsibility of say something insulting to Mr. Um, Smith so that he'll take you out in the hall and talk to you for 20 minutes. And then we don't have to have class. Have you ever seen that in your hallways? You all are a quiet group. This is the second session. Help me out a little bit here. <laughs> We've seen that, haven't we? Yes. The key here for self-control for us is, you just called my lesson stupid? Am I going to be offended at a 13-year-old or an 8-year-old who hasn't developed their you know, impulse control yet? No, nope. I'm going to remain calm. I'm a model cognition, and I'm going to respond correctly. In this case, I'm just going to say something like, well, somebody give me, what would a student say if I were teaching? Give me an example, something, an example of something like I just said, like this is stupid or this is stupid. Nevertheless, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. I'm not going to take that on right now. I'm going to take it on on my time. They're not going to distract from the teaching train or the learning train. I'm not going to allow it. Nevertheless, I understand, just be real careful. Uh, Rick Dahlgren likes to tell the story of when he was using these. And he was up there teaching one day, and he actually had the superintendent's daughter in class. And she says, I'm just so stupid. He goes, well, probably so. That's not the diffuser to use. We don't want, you have to think before you use the diffusers. You, they have to be appropriate. So remain calm, respond right. Keep the teaching train on track. These diffusers, and you can add to them, are powerful. Ms. Holland, I don't want to do this. Well, nevertheless, continue teaching. Then you know what, I'm, what I do, what I'm going to do, is I'm going to, before you leave class, we're going to have a chat. Or better yet, when you're on your way to lunch, I'm going to stop you and we're going to, I'm going to, we're going to chat between classes or on your way to lunch because guess what? They don't want you to take away their free time. And I promise you, I promise you, they will stop. I've tested this over and over. If they, try to, if they take away your class time and then you take away part of their social time on the way to lunch, that's too important to them. They're, they're not going to do that again. So silence is powerful. If you don't know what to say, stop and think for a moment. Don't just stand there and count to 10, because when you get to 10, you're still going to have the problem. You want to think. You know, we're wise teachers. We're professionals. If we think about the problem, we're going to come up with a good solution. Remember, and and when, you're, when you're teaching, you know, probably so, or they interrupt, you say, I understand. It's matter of fact. No one's offended. We're not going to start a power struggle, roll any eyes, things like that. We're just going to be matter of fact. We're going to continue teaching. If you mess up, don't worry. They're going to do it again in five seconds, and you're going to get another chance to, to practice, to perfect your craft. In the classroom, I think we probably also all experience children that when you get close to them, they close up. I don't have that many kids that do that in my area, but we do have some. So you want to remain one and a half to three feet away from them so they don't shut down. Because once they shut down, sometimes it takes a while for them to open back up. Your body language needs to match what you're... And look, I really care about you. We can do this. My body language needs to match that. They need to know that I'm sincere. Kids can pick us apart. They know when we're being sincere. And avoiding power struggles. These are actually your key terms to avoid power struggles. Usually they come under these three um, reasonings. To defend credibility, something they've learned from the past, like Miss Turner didn't teach us this way, uh, button pushing. Have you ever seen a family in a store at 5 o'clock 
after school, before dinner, mom's picking up stuff. She's got her kids with her. They're checking out, and, and, and of course, what's at the checkout counter? Candy and chips. And what do the kids, kids all do? All kids do it. Well, they, they start saying, Mom, can I have this? Mom, can I have that? No, we're not getting anything. But Jim, Jim says, Mom, I actually have a, a good one here for you if I can find it. Well, it's okay. I know the story. Um, Mom, can I have this candy bar? No, put that down. But can I please have this candy bar? No, I said no. But look, Mom, Sarah has two candy bars. And last week, you let me have a candy bar. Mom, can I please have a candy bar? Get one and put it on the counter and let's go. Is that what happens a lot of times? It is. My daughter, I have a, a five-year-old, a 10-year-old, and a 23-year-old. I've been through this once. I'm going through it again. We started all the way over again. Um, Liliana, my 10-year-old, is so good at this power struggle. And the only time she does it is with the iPad. She loves the iPad. So I've actually utilized these strategies with her at home because I'm not going to have a home where we argue. I want her to understand that we're going to respect each other. We're not going to try to bully one another because, you know, power struggles is a form of bullying. And so when Liliana asked me, Mom, can I have the iPad? No, we're not going to do the iPad today. Please, Mom, I just want to check this. Have you heard that? Can I just check this? I'll say the same thing over to her again. And you can do this in the classroom as well. We're not going to do that today. We're not going to do that today. And say it as many times as you need to, but don't get into that power struggle because they're better at it than we are. <laughs> okay. Um, if a student says in class, you didn't tell us we had to do that, simply respond, maybe so. The assignment includes... Page 22, numbers 2 through 10. A student throws a piece of paper across, across the aisle. The teacher says, I would appreciate it if you would please pick up the paper and place it in the wastebasket. The student says, but I didn't throw anything. I would appreciate it if you would get up, pick up the paper, and throw it in the wastebasket. But that's not mine. I would appreciate it if you would get up, pick up the paper, and put it in the wastebasket. So sometimes just repeating Non, don't, don't start getting upset because that's kind of sometimes what they want. Uh, they will cave and do the right thing because they know they're doing wrong. Okay? We want to keep in mind that the objectives of the smarter strategies is to maintain respect, dignity, and professionalism for both students and teachers, as well as to maintain the integrity of instructional time. We don't want to allow anything in the classroom to take place that is taking the teaching train off track. No one wins in a power struggle. Sometimes making light of the situation or bringing some humor into play can diffuse this tension and allow the student to back down gracefully. And of course our, um, you know, we're, we've got three types of kids generally in our classroom. I think that's getting more and more diverse, but some of these things are going to work 90% of the time with your kids. Then you're going to have kids that this works with 15% of the time. So you're going to see your behavior problems should mimic uh, the school-wide positive behavior intervention support uh, statistics that you have. I don't want to spend too much time there, but I want to move past on to some other um, strategies and tools to help you in your classroom. As I said before, this is our positive behavior intervention, uh, well, this is our behavior expectation matrix. You have a copy. Again, it's a draft. Please don't say, man, they've made some mistakes on here, because I have. There are some mistakes on there, but I just wanted you to get an idea of it. From that expectation matrix, again, you want to take and realize the importance of teaching each one of those expectations, teaching each group of them if necessary. We want to teach classroom expectations. We want to look for performance on the expectations. And we want to consequent behavior both positive and negative. I like this slide, and I'm going to tell you why, because we're, always, we're all going to have students that just are not going to, no matter how good of a teacher we are or how great a kid is, we're going to have some students that just are not going, these strategies are not going to work with. I had a student a few years ago that literally could not sit still. Super, super smart. 
brilliant, excellent athlete, was a star football player on the, on the, on the football team. But he literally would sit in his desk and sit and make faces and, I mean, lean back and forth and, you know, you've seen it before. I mean, and do things that I won't mimic because I'm too embarrassed to. But once you gave him a task to do, he was on it. And he could also answer any question that I had just asked in the lesson and give a wonderful explanation that no one else had thought of. He's just different. And so sometimes what I did with this, this child is um, if he was having one of those days where he was just moving all over the place and he was completely distracting learning, I could write uh, 50 referrals and that's not going to change who he is. And it's not going to change his beautiful mind. It's not going to change the situation no matter what strategy I use. Some days I just had to move him to a seat in the back to where he could move all he wanted Get instruction, not isolate him. Just keep him from distracting the other students. I had to accept that child for who he was. Don't we have to do that in life? Don't we have to work with people sometimes that, I mean, we don't want to work with? It's difficult to work with. We, our, our personalities clash. We have to be flexible and work with them. We have to do the same things with our kids sometimes. You have two samples of these lesson plans from our behavior expectation matrix. This is the example that I showed you for the Center for Teacher Effectiveness. This is a little less wordy than mine. It's important to note here that this one is particularly for elementary students. It has the goal, and you can get, you know, the Center for Teacher Effectiveness will give you a, a book of these with blank slates to where you can actually come up with these yourself where the kids will have a voice in it, your students will have a voice, and you talk about the goal together and the rationale, then you model, lead, and test. Now, this is the next part I want to get to. When we teach our expectations, it's very, very important, just like math, that we practice them with the students correctly. The teacher models the demonstration of the full range of behaviors. We actually did this in an assembly as a whole group just this past spring, uh, and, it, and it worked wonderfully to help our students give good, respectful audience behavior for our talent show. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. But you notice the procedure for teaching this expectation is to model full range of behaviors. In this particular one for listening in elementary school, we want students to have their eyes on the speaker. We want their voices off. We want their hands and feet still. We want them sitting up straight, and we want them to raise their hand to speak or ask a question. Now, we've gone over those. Now we're, gonna, we're going to, I'm going to lead the students, and so we're going to do those together. We're gonna, I'm going to do it. We're going to do it next. So would you, would you do this with me? Would you, actually, I kind of wish this one was raising your hand. Let's, let's, um, let's switch this for a second. Let's switch this to raising your hand. When I ask students to raise their hand at the beginning of the school year, especially if I have a large crowd, especially if it's elementary and they don't know how to raise their hand yet, I might say, okay, when we raise your hands, I want you to do all these things, but I also want you to raise your hand straight up to where I can see it. Straight up like this, because sometimes what do kids do? This? Does that show disrespect? Can? Or what else might they do? Right here, yeah, right here. So for, for elementary especially, I want them to raise their hand, okay? I don't want, I don't want this, because what's happening now? They're distracting class, okay? I don't want this, because what are they doing now? They're aggravating somebody else. I don't want this, because I probably can't see that, and they look like they're a little disres being disrespectful, they're frustrated. I want this, right here. I just did that, and I showed them what was unacceptable. But not only did I show them what was unacceptable, I've also shown them what was almost right, but not quite right. We don't want to just practice, we don't want to just show the what's right and the what's wrong. We want to show the gray area. We're not accepting any of this gray area. If you do anything that takes away from the instruction in class or the learning of another student, it's wrong. 
And so then we ask our students, okay, I've modeled all three for you. Exactly right? Exactly wrong. Almost right, but not quite. Now, students are only going to practice exactly right. Because perfect practice makes perfect. Not just practice. So now I want you all to do this with me because I just did it, now we're going to do it. Please show me exactly right for raising your hand. Now I'm going to make sure every single... Okay, you can put your hand down, very good. Well done, I'm proud of you. You all raised your hand perfectly. Very specific praise, you've heard all that before. Now I want to make sure that everybody has mastered that. So now you do that without me. And I may come around to a one row at a time or a group. If they're in groups, I may test a group at a time. But I'm going to test to make sure that, OK, I know you know exactly what to do. Because we, I tested it. We had eye contact. You, you showed me you knew what to do. There is no, oh, but I didn't hear you because I tested it. OK? That is a little bit, ladies and gentlemen, I feel like sometimes we all do wonderful programs for behavior, but we just throw the program out there and we expect it to work without knowing that it's going to take work. We've got to teach the expectations and reteach them. And we've got to take out the gray areas because little Johnny's good at putting his feet. You know, if mom says, don't you step one foot out that door. So what does Johnny do? He'll put two feet out the door. Or if mom says, don't put any feet out the door, He'll put the feet on the floor, and he'll lay on the floor and put the rest of his body outside. They are great at that gray area. So we have to take out that gray area, and we have to let them know the gray area will be consequence. There's a consequence to it. So we want to take that gray area. So important. So you've got two samples, and again, they're drafts. <laughs> Any feedback you want to give me is great. I'd appreciate it. You've got two samples. This is Center for Teacher Effectiveness. I'll give you that resource at the, end of, at the end of the presentation. What if your teach to doesn't work? We call these teach to's. I had an honors class one, a year before last, very, very verbal group, very verbal. And one of the things that we had, done, we had said was in this classroom, when Ms. Holland has a visitor, Please don't talk because I can't hear them, they can't hear me, and it's disrespectful. Great kids. These kids are wonderful. These kids are delightful. But when I had a visitor a few days later, guess what they did? We had done the teach too. We practiced it. We practiced it right. I modeled it. They did it. I tested it. They did it perfectly. But when I had a visitor, guess what happened? They talked. Loudly, and the longer we talked, guess what they did? The louder they got. And I, the, 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 the guests left, and I said, ladies and gentlemen, what just happened? And they, they looked like, oh my goodness, we just really were rude. <laughs> they were like a deer in headlights look. They didn't even realize they were doing it, and I know that. So we practiced it again, because you reteach is necessary. We're not... You know what? If you start fussing and yelling, it's not going to do a bit of good. That's where the self-control part of this comes in. Um, so we practice it again. A couple days later, guess what? I had a visitor. Guess what happened? You guys, are, it's lunchtime almost. Wake up. What happened? Oh, they talked. And just as loud. And when the, t when, and these are great kids. When the guests left, I just looked like, and they're like, uh-oh. It happened again. I said, okay, you kids have great hearts. I knew they did. They're good kids. I said, they're, I don't understand this. They said, Miss Holland, we're sorry. We don't either. We know we did the wrong thing. They didn't understand why they had done it either. So I, I said, okay, you know what? We're going to find a solution to this. We're going to problem solve. And I just, I said, I'm going to think about this. Let me think about this. It did not take a minute or two for me to realize this is a learned behavior they've been doing now since, who knows, five, fifth grade, fourth grade, third grade? It was ingrained kinesthetically. Do you know what I mean by kinesthetic? Of course you do. It was ingrained kinesthetically in, so, in, in every other way that, that I don't know. <laughs> it was ingrained. 
So I had to, I had done all these things. I had explained, I had rehearsed, I had reinforced. I've got to rethink this one. It did not work. You guys have learned when you're sitting, it's okay to talk. In assemblies, in, on, uh, in chatting with your friends, in the lunchroom, that's what they do. It's what you do when you're sitting. Let's try this. In my daughter's school, they stand when a guest comes in, and they put their hands behind their back, just like we do when a bride comes down the aisle, just like we do when the pastor gets up to read scripture or whatever else you can think of. And so I said, okay, let's do this. Let's add this to this teach too. When I have a guest, you stand and put your hand behind your back. We practiced it. I modeled it. We showed them exactly right, not quite right. They modeled the practice. We, pra we role played. We role play a lot. Guess what? I had a visitor come in just a few days later. And do you know what they did? They stood up. Not everyone remembered at first, but one student remembered. And as soon as, as, soon as that student stood up and did this, it was a ripple effect. The rest of them stood up. I want you to know that happened all throughout the year. And all the women that came in to visit me, for one reason or another, always left wiping tears. They, are they standing for me? They weren't used to having that respect from their students. That's not for every teacher. I'm just telling you, we can find a solution when we need to without, without just being negative, without just saying, you kids are just... You're rotten. You can't remember a rule. You're rot They're not rotten. They have learned some, 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 some behaviors that can change if we will take the time to think. <laughs> In all the free time we have, if we will take the time to think. Okay? Remember, and I had to do this after, after uh, Labor Day, after fall break, after Thanksgiving, after Christmas. They knew we were just going to reteach, relearn, practice our rules and expectations. I don't know if I put in your handout or not. One thing we're moving to this year in our school is teaching these in context. I don't think I did. I gave it to you. Where do you think you should practice classroom etiquette? I'm sorry, um, cafeteria manners? In the cafeteria. How many of us do that, though? What if we did what I did with my students and the visitor, what if we did that with our students in the cafeteria and regularly repeated that? Would that, do you think that we could get some positive change in cafeteria behavior? Yes, I bet we could. I really think we could make some positive changes. So we even have a set of expectations for our uh, students when they're cafeteria, in their cafeteria. We have advisory every week, I think this year, and when they're in, maybe it's every other week. We have data notebooks to do one week and advisory the next. I'm not exactly sure how it's going to end up. But in our advisory groups, we're going to take our kids to the cafeteria and we're going to do these lesson plans. For hallway behavior, for bathroom behavior, for locker room behavior, they've got to be taught in context. And then retaught and changed when needed. This is a picture of my students when I had a guest come into the classroom. They had learned to stand. Uh, I want to mention accountable talk. And I gave you some, I gave you just a few, I just pulled one of these off Pinterest and then the State Department. How are we going to, do you all learn, do you all remember, you've, you've got the list from the State Department on accountable talk. How many of you have those memorized? I, I don't. I don't. I keep them on my wall and I try to use them, but I don't have them memorized and I should. That's one of my goals for this year, my personal goals professionally. I, and then we have one teacher that keeps these up in the back of her room so that she can just look up and it's so big she can see it. Here's how, my, um, can you say more? Uh, say, say why this works. What does this mean? It gives us it gives us a visual of what we can say to keep instructional focus in our classrooms at all times, because once we engage in non-instructional focus talk, if it gets off focus, it's going to spread very quickly through our classroom. There's a time for that non-contingent interaction between classes, when, but not during instructional time. Uh, this, I thought this was neat. Uh, this is for elementary. And um, I need to check my time here. But this is for elementary. I kind of liked this, um, 
visual for what kind of talk we were doing at the time in class. And let me check time before I keep going. I, I, want, I don't want to go over. We got 13 minutes, is that correct? 12, 15? Okay. So if you'll flip through your handout that I gave you, I know we all have behavior and exp um, programs at our school. My school has steps, step one, step two. The very last page, please. We have a discipline plan. You have to. You have to have documentation. You have to. But I understand that ch children are coming to my classroom from a diversity of backgrounds, and I, I have to use some... Uh, fair does not always mean equal. So I've got to have something that I can use that will fill in the gaps of, okay, when do I put you on step one for this? When do I put you on step two for this? I've got to provide a way for children to change their behavior. I've got to give them a way for, to empower them to change their behavior. And this here, refocus, is, is technically a trademark name from Time to Teach and the Center for Teacher Effectiveness. The, the sheet that I gave you is, I call it a rethink sheet. I made this in my classroom. It's a draft. As you can see, it's not professionally done at all. Let's say that you're instructing and you have a student that's tapping on the desk. Do you ever get students that are tapping on the desk? Yeah. Or playing with a pencil or something. And, but, and you need to ask yourself, okay, and this is what I'm going to ask. This, these are three questions you need to ask yourself. Um, can I teach with that going on? We call these classroom integrity questions, or CIQs. Classroom integrity questions, CIQs. Can I teach? Can everyone around him learn? Can he still learn? If the behavior that's taking place is, is interrupting any three of those processes, I'm going to intervene. I'm going to intervene early and quickly and appropriately. Can I teach with him tapping the desk? Can others around him learn? Can he? If the answer to any one of those is no, I'm going to intervene. I'm going to matter-of-factly say, I, I'm, I need quiet hands, please. Thank you. And I'm going to go right back to teaching. I just brought him to focus that, non, in a matter of fact way, I need quiet hands, please, thank you. I didn't say, stop what you're doing. Once I say, stop what you're doing, what have I done to that student? I'm, I can't hear you. Social isolation. Have I kind of caused him to shut down? Have I even fostered resistance? Did someone say resistance? Have I embarrassed him a little bit? What do kids do, especially middle school, when they're embarrassed? What do they think they have to do? Lash out. They have, I mean, you're embarrassing them. You're not going to embarrass me. I'm going to show you. And they really don't want to, but they have an image to uphold. So we want to consider the difference between a startup request. It's an invitation. I know you're not meaning to do this. I need quiet hands, please. Thank you. I'm respectful. Or I need silence in group two, please. Thank you. I need you to wait to sharpen that pencil till I'm finished with this instruction. Thank you. Matter of fact, what happens? Are we clear on that first step? Everybody good with that? Just the difference between a shutdown. Give me some other shutdown requests. In other words, stop that. You've let them aggravate you now. You let it go on too long. Or you didn't have self-control and patience, and you, that's just the way you respond, which I don't believe any of you would. But there are teachers that may. What are some other shutdown requests? What did I just ask you? Anybody else? But you know what I'm talking about, right? Thank you. How many times? Like, you're a total idiot. How many times do I have to? That is what we're saying to them. But what if we say instead, I need quiet hands, please. Thank you. You're not too soft. You're not too, fir too firm. 
your matter of fact, you believe in them, we're going to move on. You're going to give good wait time. Three to five seconds or more. And your, your compliance will increase at least 80% when you do that. After that time, if they don't stop, you're not going to give a repeated warning. You're not going to give a repeated request. You are not going to join that dance, so to speak. You're simply going to say, I need you to refocus, please. Thank you. Or room 10. Now, the reason that we have two options here is because when I did refocus or rethinking in my classroom, I didn't use a buddy teacher. Uh, I just used the back, because I had room, I used the back of my classroom. And there was a place where they could get up. They knew how to do this. And this is a teach to. It should be in your um, classroom management plan that you teach to. They have to give me a graceful exit. Exit. You get up quietly. You don't interrupt instruction. You pick up this form on the back of the cabinet where you're not distracting anyone. You sit down. You fill it out. You're going to wait there for me to welcome you back to class. Now, some rules apply to this rethink form. You have to fill in almost all the blanks. You can know one word. I put all those, those blanks there for a reason. You're going to think through. You're going to give me complete sentences and explain everything. What behavior did you do wrong? What should I have done? What will I do next time? What would be an appropriate response from my teacher if I'm found acting inappropriately a second time? And then I have on here, did I contact the parent over this? The great thing about this is it takes the paperwork off you. It's all in their own handwriting. It empowers them to problem solve. And you didn't, they're not shut down because you didn't, you didn't shut them down. You're empowering them to do some problem solving, to think for themselves. And then they're standing at the back of the room. They're ready to come back. You look at it very quickly on your time when you're ready, when you're not, when you come to a break, maybe everyone's working problem number six. You're going to look at it to make sure it's right, that it's filled out. You're going to say, welcome back, have a seat, we're on number two. You're not going to talk to them right then because you don't want to interrupt instruction. So instruction continues throughout, and this is kind of it in a nutshell. You intervene early. Ask your classroom integrity questions. If it requires early intervention, make sure you give a startup request, give appropriate wait time, graceful exit, graceful entrance, refocus, welcome back, all matter of fact. And again, if you don't teach the process, they're not going to do it appropriately. This is an example of a typical classroom uh, interaction. Everyone, it's time to put our diagrams away and return to our seats. Stanley begins, uh, he just lies there on the floor while everyone else gets ready to go. Stanley, would you please put away your diagram? I will. Stanley, in your seat, please. It's time for math. Well, now everybody's watching. What math? It's the math we worked on together over recess yesterday. Oh, I forgot that at home. No, Stanley, it's right there on your desk, the yellow paper. Stanley's doing this on purpose. It's a power struggle, and we took the bait. This is better. Everyone, it's time to put away your diagrams and return to our seats. Stanley stays. Stanley, I know you love this. I actually wouldn't say stuff, but I know you love this, but let's move on to math now. Stanley continues working. I need you to refocus, please. Thank you. No more words. And at the end of this, you've saved probably 100 words or more. Okay. We've talked about shutdown versus startup requests. Uh, this is my filing cabinet where my students, and I have, well, this was last year's seating arrangement. I had them in groups because when I was instructing, I never wanted a child to be left out of instruction. I wanted to be able to get to every child and make them feel like part of a group. So in my classroom arrangement, I could actually completely circle every group. They were a group. They were a cohort, so to speak. They worked together to problem solve. I took out that um, sea of children, so to speak. I always want to make sure that every single student knows that they are important in every class period and every exercise and everything we do. They are part of our community. Um, I try to make sure that all my visuals, 
that would be distracting or too colorful or either on the sides or the back. What I have up front is my objectives. These were two years ago, so they're just SPIs for math. And of course, I make sure I include up here at the top my 12 powerful words, analyze. Those are the words that I want to remember, just like my accountable talk. What, what do I need to be saying to them? What am I supposed to be asking them? I want to make my words count. And I think we're about out of time. <laughs> Please know that you can do everything right, but they're still not fully developed. They're still cooking, and it's our wonderful opportunity to get to, to make a positive difference in their lives, and it's just one of the most wonderful jobs we could ever have. And I hope that you've picked up something that you can use today in your classes this year. If you have any questions, please let me know. If you would like some resources, um, you can email me. Uh, Jay Holland at bradleyschools.org. I promised you some resources. I am a huge fan of Harry Wong. I have my classroom procedures and my notebook. I'm a big fan of having a cohesive management plan like PBIS for your school. But I'm just as big of a fan of Rick Dahlgren and Time to Teach because if you don't, if you have a faculty that does not know how to employ these strategies of self-control, you can have any management plan in the world, the best one in the world, and it will not be effective. So Rick Dahlgren, Center for Teacher Effectiveness and Time to Teach is your third resource. Can I answer any questions? <laughs> Thank you for coming today. I'll be up here for just a few minutes.